Uh, so first, let me start by saying this is the House Health Care Committee. Uh, this is um, Tuesday, March 9th. It's uh, about 1.45. And we are hearing testimony today about the replacement of the secure residential facility currently in the Middlesex, currently in Middlesex, Vermont. We have a number of witnesses. And I'm going to request that when witnesses are not testifying, if they would go off video, it's easier for me to monitor the screen and then have you come on video when you are testifying. I, I see we have a number of witnesses with us um, that uh, will help me. And I think it's, it, works for, it works for everyone, I, I hope. Um, let me start by saying we are going to be hearing first from the Commissioner, uh, from Commissioner Squirrel and Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox, who are going to do a presentation about the Department of Mental Health's uh, current proposal for the replacement of the secure residential facility. We then have, uh, to my knowledge, we have five additional witnesses. Uh, actually, I beg your pardon, I think we have actually six additional witnesses scheduled today. Uh, we've received many letters uh, with varying points of view about this, about this facility and what should happen and, or not happen. Um, and as a result, we have also scheduled additional testimony for this committee on Wednesday afternoon after the floor. Um, so you will at some point, if not today, you will at some point see a list of some additional witnesses who will be, who will be invited to comment as well. We recognize that this is a, this, this replacing this facility has uh, many issues involved in it. And it is a point, it has a point of uh, some, indeed some controversy. Uh, so we are listening carefully both to witnesses, but also to um, written testimony that's shared with us. We're receiving emails and letters and they will be entered into our record and shared with the full committee. So, um, oh, one other, one other announcement for our committee is that we, I am asking our committee to convene tomorrow morning at 8.30. I hope that works for everyone. Apologies for the short notice, but um, given the potential list of witnesses for tomorrow morning uh, and their availability, the times when they're available, I'm asking our committee to convene at 8.30 tomorrow morning. And I'll ask Colleen to help us remind ourselves of that uh, as well. So I think with that, uh, I'm, I would like us to proceed with hearing from the commissioner and deputy commissioner. My anticipation is that we will, uh, we will take some period of time to hear this presentation, to entertain some questions uh, this is not a time for other witnesses to ask questions. This is a time for the committee. Uh, we will then proceed to hear from our witnesses and we've asked them to each uh, take 10 to 15 minutes at the most so that we get to hear from each witness. Uh, and I believe that hopefully that will work sufficiently. Uh, the initial presentation by the department, however, will be a longer presentation and we anticipate that, but we do need to allow for, so I'm going to look to, uh, uh, monitor the time we're taking and we'll, we'll manage it. So with that, uh, welcome commissioner, deputy commissioner, and I'm going to, I think you have a presentation to share as well. Is that right? But I'm going to turn it over to you, commissioner squirrel, and you can take it from here and work with Colleen if there's a screen to be shared. Great. Thank you, Chair Lippert. Um, for the record, Sarah Squirrel, Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health. Great to see you all this afternoon. I am joined by Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox. Uh, we also have Dr. Allison Richards, who is joining us, our Medical Director from Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, uh, Dr. Janice Lavelle, mm -hmm. Lavelle and Dr. Janice, or Kevin Huckshorn, who will be joining us. Um, they are national thought and content experts that have supported the department, um, really support uh, the six core strategies. So we'll be hearing from them also. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen just so I can walk through the presentation. And then when we get to the Q&A portion um, for the chair, I'll try to pull that down so everyone can see each other. Um, I know right. that can be challenging when we do the screen share. So let me 
see if I can get this right. While we're getting the screen share going, I'm saying, uh, I will see if we can take a break in the midst of this. We have a full mm -hmm. afternoon. We'll see if we can take at least a stretch break, if not a longer break. Okay, can folks, do folks see the presentation? Yes, it's in full screen. Excellent. Okay, well, I will go ahead and get started and just jump right in. Um, there were two uh, documents that were shared with the committee. Uh, one is an overview of the proposed recovery residence. Uh, we will not be using that for our presentation today. Um, it is designed to be a reference document for you all as legislators, uh, for the public uh, to kind of go back um, and review uh, what we are proposing um, in terms of the future recovery residence. And then in addition to that, we have our slide deck of the presentation that we've provided as well. So a few areas that I'll be hoping to cover, um, just a little bit of the history of the current Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence, uh, talk about system of care needs, capacity analysis and costs of care in the system, uh, the future recovery residence and what we envision, um, sharing of clinical perspectives um, from Dr. Richards, uh, Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox will be walking through very briefly um, some high level design ideas related to the future recovery residents. And then we'll be hearing briefly um, from Dr. LaBelle and Dr. Huckshorn and talking a little bit about next steps. So in terms of the history of the current residents, I know that many um, members of this committee um, have visited the residents. Um, and certainly, you know, just to kind of back up and say that, you know, broadly as a state right now, as we continue to grapple with the impacts of the pandemic, having a strong, stable mental health system of care is ab absolutely critical. Um, so going back in time a bit when Hurricane Irene um, changed our mental health system of care, uh, we moved to a decentralized system of care for a Vermont State Hospital level of care, created a a system of which we have level one beds across the state. That was actually when uh, the current Middlesex Therapeutic Residence was created. Um, it was identified even at that time that individuals uh, that were ready to step down required a secure setting in order to be safe and to continue on their recovery. Um, so that was when the current Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence was created. It was built using FEMA funds. Um, it was intended to be temporary and again, intended to support those individuals who were no longer in need of inpatient level of care, but who still required intensive services in a secure setting. Um, just in terms of, you know, there are some additional legal components related to individuals' admissions um, to the program. Um, individuals uh, are under an involuntary legal status under the care and custody of the Commissioner of Mental Health. Um, there also is an order of non-hospitalization indicating by the court um, that this individual requires this level of care in a secure setting. Uh, so just wanted to note that as well. This is just a quick review for those who have not seen the current recovery residence in Middlesex. Um, it is a temporary facility. Um, it is clear you know, from the photos that it was designed to be temporary. It has outlived its lifespan and it needs to be replaced. Um, there are many site issues um, that some folks who have visited have certainly observed not having a permanent foundation, um, which leads to a whole host of um, moisture uh, issues, repair issues, et cetera. In terms of the current operations, it is licensed as a therapeutic community residence. It's about 6,000 square feet. Um, the current funding is global commitment funding um, with some private pay. And the budget is approximately $2.9 million in operating costs. And we have about 25 or 28 full-time staff um, at the current program. I wanna talk a little bit about the system of care. And I think in order for us to provide the best care possible for Vermonters, that really does require us to have a continuum. Um, increasing our step-down capacity in the system has been identified as a critical need. Uh, I think a permanent secure program will continue and does continue to be a continued need um, for those individuals who still require 24 seven treatment and support. 
I think the replacement and expansion of the current Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence is a, an essential and smart solution in terms of addressing some of the systemic challenges that we face across the state. Um, and certainly as we reflect on, you know, some of the proxies that we use to evaluate um, how we're doing as a system of care, um, long wait times in emergency rooms are certainly in, symptomatic of what we call inadequate flow in the system, which is our ability to really, you know, manage individuals with minimal delays as they transition through levels of care. And for those individuals who might no longer require hospitalization, but continued have continued treatment needs, really need to have a safe, stable, secure, step-down environment to go to. And that essentially does free up those beds for individuals um, who might be waiting in EDs and would benefit um, from one of our inpatient beds. Um, the other thing I would just note, and I'll hone in on this again when we talk about the data to support the need for expanded capacity, is that the individuals um, who are coming to the current therapeutic residence um, are primarily coming from our level one beds, um, that they do represent high and long lengths of stay in our inpatient beds. I think in 2019, uh, the five individuals who were admitted to the secure recovery residence on average had a length of stay of 300 days in the hospital. Um, so you can see how our ability um, to discharge these individuals to a lower level of care um, has a significant impact on inpatient bed availability for others. And just for comparison, um, the typical length of stay in an inpatient unit is about seven days or less. A little bit on the current uh, Middlesex data is that 95% uh, of referrals um, to the secure residents are from level one units across the state. We have served 53 individuals since its opening. Um, the average length of stay is between eight and 10 months. 65% uh, of the residents have stepped down to less restrictive settings or independent housing. Um, and just the graph on the bottom just shows the occupancy rate um, over the past few years, um, indicating you know, very high occupancy rates in general um, in terms of demand for this. Um, and again, that it has been you know, very successful um, in creating this transitional step down um, so that individuals can then move successfully um, to different levels of support in the community. We have seen this slide before. This is really just meant to demonstrate and illustrate visually the step-down capacity that we're talking about. And when we think about the continuum of care, strength across the continuum of care, it is critical that we have strength in all areas. Um, so this really gives you the sense of, you know, how we see that continuum of care from our level one inpatient units to our general inpatient units to the secure residential programming, the specialized enhanced funding that we have that supports many of the MyPad programs, the Pierce House across the state, our array of intensive recovery residences, our mental health crisis beds, group homes, transitional staffed housing um, and individuals who um, have shelter plus care vouchers. So they have independent living uh, with services that might be attached. Um, and of course, there may be those individuals who are living in um, independent housing, but might simply be accessing um, outpatient services as well. So again, just to give you a sense of that continuum, when we think about the system of care and beds. You know, one of the questions that has come up a lot in terms of, you know, the current secure recovery residents and what DMH um, is proposing is clarity on the level of care attributes. Um, and how do we differentiate between um, hospital level of care and the secure step down that we currently have? Um, and I think that's a good question and it's an important one for the department to clarify. Um, so when we think about inpatient level of care, um, we're providing care and treatment to someone who is in an acute phase of a psychiatric crisis. Um, they're requiring immediate assessment and stabilization. Um, they are at risk of harm to themselves or others due to dysregulation, due to the mental health challenges that they might be experiencing. There may be court ordered non-emergency medications um, and the provision of emergency and voluntary procedures. 
when we think about the secure step down capacity, we think about that as step down level of care. Um, and again, really designed for individuals who are subacute, uh, meaning that they no longer need hospital level of care. Um, they've received that assessment and stabilization. They are ready to step down, um, but they might not be ready to step down right directly into the community and other levels of care and require this additional transitional step down support. Um, and what this additional programming provides through the current recovery residents and will be expanded and enhanced with the new recovery residents because of the improvements in the environment of care is a safe and secure environment, individual and group ther therapy that could be readily ac accessed, uh, skill building really to help individuals um, improve their own capacity to manage their symptoms and social skills, building those daily living skills, whether that's cooking and food preparation, um, cleaning and house care, dental and physical hygiene, and then supported in community engagement is another one of the key tenants and attributes of the step down level of care um, in terms of, you know, preparing to go to the grocery store, meeting with care providers in the community, um, and opportunities to practice social engagement um, and skills in the community. It really is designed to help residents to develop and implement those skills that will help them integrate back to, to their lives um, and back into the community um, through this transitional step-down support. The next slide, um, again, this is a good question that's been posed by um, committee members, um, members of the public, other interested parties in terms of you know, as we looked at that step down capacity continuum, how the cost of care um, then correlates um, to the different step down um, or different continuum of cares and levels of care in the system. Uh, so we've tried to articulate there in terms of approximate daily operating costs for the different levels of care. Um, so you can see at the top of this uh, chart, uh, we have level one intensive inpatient care, the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, the level one beds at the Brattleboro Retreat, as well as the level one beds at Rutland Regional Medical Center, which range from about $1,800 a day up to $2,600 a day. Um, our non-level one inpatient units, um, which the average per diem rate um, paid to these hospitals is just over $1,700 a day. The current secure residential, um, which has an operating budget of $3.1 million at about $1,200 a day. And then the proposed secure residential, which would increase capacity. The current estimated operating cost is about $9.1 million, just under $1,600 a day. Uh, we are going to be talking about some changes in terms of some of the attributes of the programming, um, and that will likely decrease um, those operating costs, but uh, we have kept it as is for now, but we will have some information to share shortly that uh, will likely influence um, that daily rate a bit, if you will. Um, the average cost per day for our intensive recovery residences, our community-based recovery residents, uh, the Soteria House specifically, and then intensive supported housing, um, which is really looking at the daily operating costs of um, the MyPad programs. And I see Representative Donahue has a question. Just quickly, that, um, you don't identify the level one's beds at the retreat that are coming online. Is there a rate known for them yet, or is that just expected to be uh, the same rate, because you, you list uh, 14, but there's actually going to be 26 total, correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, so this was the last cost settled rate. Um, so I would anticipate, Representative Donahue, that the rate will be close to that, but it may go up a little bit, just given inflationary costs of care, probably more reliance on locum docs and travel nurses at this time due to COVID. Um, but I, I think it will be close to that, but probably slightly higher. And just to note, um, given that we are focused today on um, our proposal for the new secure residential, um, that of that $9.1 million in operating costs, um, we do uh, utilize uh, Medicaid funds to support that. 
So if we were using that 9.1 million number, for example, as I mentioned, I do anticipate that will change and go down. Um, we we um, would need an additional $2.7 million of general fund um, to support that. Um, and again, that may shift, but just because we are able to utilize um, Medicaid funds, um, just to note that the, the general fund need for that would be about $2.7 million. Okay. So I want to spend some time talking about uh, the future recovery residents, uh, what we are proposing for the committee. Um, we propose to replace the current secure Middlesex therapeutic residents with a 16 bed facility um, that would continue to be physically secure, uh, that would provide the highest quality of care possible, ensuring the safety of residents in an environment of care that is recovery oriented and promotes rejoining and rebuilding a life in the community. It is designed and will continue to be designed for individuals who are subacute and who are ready to discharge from inpatient hospitals, but do have higher treatment needs, um, may have risk factors um, that might impact public safety and their safety, and may actually exceed the capacity of community providers. So when we think about this transitional step or this transitional step down programming and why it is so essential is that we do have a cohort of individuals that have very high acuity needs in the state of Vermont um, that cannot be immediately served um, by our community programs, given some of the safety risks that they may present. Um, this is a specialized population, as I said, that cannot be immediately accommodated in other settings. And I feel a deep sense of responsibility as the Commissioner of Mental Health to ensure that for those individuals who are ready to step down from level one beds, that we have the appropriate transitional programming for them to keep them safe and to keep the community safe. I think we are also thinking about trying to enhance equitable access to appropriate, timely, and high quality care and treatment. Um, we certainly want that equitable access even for individuals that have some of the highest needs across the state of Vermont. Um, and we certainly do not want individuals who are ready to step down, um, who cannot be served successfully at the community level um, and may have um, community placements um, that do not work and then results in those individuals um, ending back up in our emergency departments and being re-hospitalized. Um, as I mentioned, expanding this level of care uh, for the subacute population still addressing their need for stabilization and active treatment um, will really help support those individuals in terms of their recovery. Um, the other piece I would just note is that, you know, the program is capable of serving individuals with forensic needs and increased risk. Um, individuals who have forensic needs who might come through the criminal justice system they are a part of the population that we are required to provide care for. Um, we know that many individuals come into the mental health system due to interactions with the criminal justice system. Um, it is certainly our responsibility to provide appropriate care and treatment to those individuals as well, um, to ensure that their safety needs can be met, um, community safety needs can be met, that they can work on those daily living skills that they need and then successfully transition to the community. Representative Donahue, do you have a question? Oh, thank you. Okay. I'm sorry. It's uh, when the screen is up, it's hard to see the side screen. Also, didn't realize my hand was still up. And as I noted again, just sharing um, what we're thinking about in terms of the future recovery residents, it does serve um, individuals uh, with the highest acuity in the state who are ready to discharge. As I mentioned, 95% of those referrals come from level one units. Um, so we do feel strongly that replacing the current residents, expanding its capacity will have a significant and material impact in terms of improving flow in the system. Um, as I mentioned, given the high acuity of these individuals, um, they are occupying um, inpatient bed days at a much higher proportion, as I stated the, the data earlier, um, in terms of length of stays in hospitals of 
um, up to 300 days. Um, so I think that you know our proposal from our perspective is the right thing for the system of care and for Vermonters um, without this capacity in the system and without the expanded capacity in the system, I think we would be doing a real disservice to those individuals who are ready to step down, need this and additional transitional support in a safe and secure setting so that they can continue on their journey to recovery. Um, we also value collaboration and partnership as a department, and those are really key tenants of advancing what I would call urgent and important capacity in our system of care. And we have certainly demonstrated our capacity and investment and commitment to listening to stakeholders across the state, I think was evidenced by the approach that we took um, to creating our 10 year vision, you know, where we spent you know, almost a year fanning out across the community, listening to Vermonters to really inform that work. Um, and our commitment to that is no different now. Um, we understand that there have been uh, significant concerns raised to the department regarding the proposed use of proposed use of seclusion and restraint um, at the recovery residence. And I think what I can say is that we've heard you. We have heard your feedback. We have taken it into consideration, um, and which is why we are no longer proposing the use of seclusion and restraint at the expanded program. What we really want to do is to ensure that this expanded capacity can serve to support this group of individuals um, who deserve step down capacity in our system of care. We want to work with our community providers, hospitals, stakeholders, and advocacy partners to think about the programming to really boost peer support and positions in a meaningful way in the expanded program, to continue to work collaboratively with DRVT, NAMI, Vermont Psychiatric Survivors, Legal Aid, and other advocacy partners to ensure that that community voice is integrated into the design, um, to look at evidence-based assessments, to evaluate the level of care that is needed for individuals, and to create admissions criteria that reflect that other community placements might not be available for these individuals, and hence why this transitional level of support is so needed. Uh, Commissioner, I'm gonna step in here uh, because I think what you just stated is a very significant alteration of the proposal that has been put forward initially by the department. And I don't want it to get lost in, I mean, if I'm understanding correctly, and I, I don't want to misunderstand, and I don't want others to misunderstand, but I think I heard what you said was that you, the department is no longer proposing to include the use of seclusion and restraint at the proposed replacement facility. Did I understand that correctly? That is correct. Okay. Well, again, I think that's a significant alteration of the initial proposal and one which needs to be fully uh, heard and understood. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interrupting this because I think that's a, that's, that's a, a notable change. Uh, I, want, I want to hear, I see Representative Peterson has his hand up. Uh, I want to hold most questions if we can uh, to later. I want to be able to hear the full presentation by the commissioner and I frankly interrupted because I don't want that to get lost in the process. So if Representative Peterson, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll get back to you. Uh, thank you, Chair Lippert. And we also you know, want to thank all of our partners um, across the system who have provided input. It is our job at lead, as leaders at the Department of Mental Health um, to, to take all input into consideration as we think about um, these critical programs for Vermonters. So I do wanna thank everyone uh, for their input around that um, and really welcome everyone and invite continued conversation about um, the continued design um, of the program. I'm going to go through a couple additional slides, maybe one more, just related to data supporting the expanded capacity. I think it's important that the department really be able to articulate why we need the expanded capacity in addition to replacing um, the current seven bed um, facility. Um, as I noted, we have had good outcomes um, as a result of this program, you know, serving individuals who are ready to step down and transition to the community. 
I certainly think we all recognize that um, the impact of the pandemic on escalating mental health needs is something we also need to take into consideration um, when we talk about the increase in mental health needs um, over the next couple of years, um, if not longer, as we go forward. And the demand for high intensity services in our state is certainly not decreasing. Uh, we continue to see 95 to 100% occupancy in our level one beds. And then of course, that direct correlation between this cohort of individuals who have um, acute needs who are also occupying higher um, uh, bed days um, in the system. And by creating and expanding this transitional level of care, we essentially you know, really unlock some areas of the system and create more access um, to those inpatient beds. Um, also just to note, um, the improved environment of care of the new design does enhance program treatment capacity. So going from two trailers that we put together with FEMA funding um, to an environment of care um, with additional space I think also will really expand our capacity to support individuals. Um, certainly the occupancy rate of the current residents um, indicates high need for this level of care in the system. Our analysis of residential bed needs found that, you know, based on that point in time data, um, that inpatient facilities do indicate that at any given time, there are at least seven to 10 individuals who would benefit from the step down level of care. Certainly taking into consideration Vermont's 10-year vision to decrease inpatient bed capacity, which is something we have articulated, you know, as we think about improving and expanding integration of mental health and healthcare, community supports over the long term as we decrease our reliance on inpatient care. You know, having these secure um, programs, therapeutic programs, will be even more critical to us as a state. And of course, we need to have the long range view of being aware that the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services are requiring us as a state to really think about, at least from a fiscal standpoint, um, the phase down of IMDs. Uh, so we are looking at um, you know, our need to phase down um, from our IMDs and our inpatient care. And again, we wanna be thoughtful about the investments that we are making now, um, knowing that that is something we as a state and a system are going to be grapple with. And I think I guess finally I'll wrap up and then turn it over to, I believe Dr. Richards, You know, as a, a commissioner who at any given time has over 300 individuals under my care and custody. I do feel a deep sense of responsibility to ensure that we have adequate step down care for all individuals who require it. Um, even those individuals who have increased acuity um, in order to serve those individuals, you know, they also deserve equitable access to quality care um, so that they can access those treatment services, recovery services, um, and then transition to the community. And if we don't provide services to those individuals, um, then the question we need to ask ourselves is who will? So I will pause there. Um, and I believe I am going to turn it over to Dr. Richards, uh, who will share um, a bit of her clinical perspective. Hello, can you see me and hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. So I, I just wanted to say thank you, Commissioner Squirrel, and thank you, committee, for the opportunity to speak. My name is Allison Richards, and I'm the medical director at the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about having the privilege to work with this group of individuals that the commissioner is talking about that have high complex mental health needs. I appreciate the attention that this project is getting and I have an important perspective to, to share with you. I also just wanted to share a little bit about where some of this comes from. I have my own story in the mental health system, having a father who had mental illness and psychiatric hospitalization, a son with neurological and psychiatric illness that has resulted in hospitalizations and restraints, and then my own mental health story. And all of these things have led me to where I am today and the compassion that I feel in the work that I do every day. I've been working as a physician and psychiatrist in Vermont since 2007. 
and I came here to Vermont in all honesty to be part of a different experience in training in psychiatry where the focus was on therapy and helping shift the culture of care, which has been happening at the old state hospital and more so at Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, where we continue to make changes for the people who struggle in their lives and are hospitalized. I have worked at the current um, Middlesex um, residence where when I was there, we did open dialogue style rounds just to give you a sense of the kind of care provided with every resident. Residents would go out fishing, cooking, we ate meals together. And it was an opportunity for people to recover, to go out into the community and get on with their lives. And I don't want it to be perceived as a prison or anything like that. It was actually a nice community, but it's in much need of an improved facility and and also capacity. Um, I do evaluations for the Department of Correction, well, for the Department of Mental Health and Department of Corrections, and it's quite a striking difference. And, and that's part of what some of these individuals needing this type of residence, um, I can speak to that, I would say. So I'm asking you just not to lose sight of the people that truly need this level of care that's critical to their path in recovery. So I want to tell you a little bit about some of the people that I have worked with and gotten to know over the years that this group of individuals that have been impacted by not having the expanded capacity and access to the programming that the new recovery residents are supposed to have and is being proposed. In some sense, I'll say they're voiceless individuals. Um, they're not here to tell you their stories themselves. I will do my best to tell you it as I have known them, but um, certainly they aren't here. And I think there are two different sides, but I'm going to try to offer you a little bit of what I have known. Um, so, when you are trying to recover, I guess I would say, you know, it is very difficult when you are living in the current facility. The two FEMA trailers, they're attached, they're intended to be used for a short period of time, and now they're going on their eighth year of operation. It lacks the amenity, space, and design that these individuals deserve when they're moving on into their lives. Um, they all all want kind of a private, I think everyone that I've worked with has always wanted a private space, their own bathroom, like their own space to call their own, and then their own opportunity to, to work, which is also something that that recovery residence has supported jobs and, and moving on in life. Um, so not only do we need that, but the new facility would allow people to open their windows and breathe air and have the space so that they can um, move on in their lives. And again, they're not here to speak for themselves. So here's something that we can all agree on. Life is challenging and difficult, um, especially when you have a mental illness and the people that I'm talking about and the difficult experiences that they have been through that put themselves and others at risk of harm. Um, sometimes their, their families are at risk of harm and the people that they are love and are closest to are impacted. They deserve a place to receive care and to be able to work towards their recovery. And despite these difficult experiences, however dangerous there are people, they have families and they deserve a place to be, not to be left behind. I don't, I just want to reiterate that, that these are people that wouldn't have any other option at this current point. Um, I agree there should be more apartments in the community. Um, the community needs more resources, but this is again a group that can't be served at that level. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the individuals. I'm trying to give you three people. They're kind of more than three people because they're anonymous and I've given them names. But, but just so that you understand like the complexities of these individuals. So Greg is a 40-year-old man with a history of numerous psychiatric hospitalizations. He's lived at various group living settings. His length of stay at the group living set situations very vary from days to weeks to months because the transitions often result in rehospitalization. His hospitalization history includes needing non-emergency involuntary medications. He, he will stop medications in the community. And then at several of the intensive recovery residences where he's either eloped or assaulted other people, he's kind of been seen as someone that they can no longer safely serve. He stabilizes when he's in the hospital on medications, but then there aren't any other agencies, VAs or peer-run programs or Second Spring intensive residentials that 
feel that they can safely meet his need due, due to ongoing violence. And this is a situation where the new expanded facility with a new environment of care could, I think, with the right programming that the commissioner is talking about, they, this gentleman, Greg, could be referred to that program. Another example is Randy. He's 45. He's been charged with murder. He's been found incompetent to stand trial due to mental illness. And he's refused medication and was not is not on medication because he wasn't symptomatic in the hospital enough that the court um, thought he needed medication. And so the order was denied. But he does remain delusional. He's not treated. And due to public safety concerns and this history of alleged extreme violence of murder, no community providers feel that they can serve him in the community. But this is someone that could be referred to this new facility and safely help to reintegrate and, and adjust to life and free up a bed. And the last is Gretchen. She's 38. She's a woman who has a long history of inpatient hospitalization, including court-ordered non-emergency and voluntary medications. Um, the medications don't always seem to help, and she doesn't respond. She remains psychotic at baseline. And she has this regulated moments that are erratic. She'll destroy property. She assaults other people. Um, and she remains psychotic. And these are like every four to six weeks. And other than these, she's OK behaviorally. They're just these little blips that put other people at risk. And due to these you know, episodes where she struggles, the community providers also feel that they can't guarantee the safety of the other residents in those programs. And so she would be someone that a facility like the new recovery residence could tolerate a bad day with the additional space and the environment of care. I think that's the proposal is, you know, with Kevin Huckshorn and Janice is working on tolerate, letting people work through that distress. But just wanted to thank you for your time and thank you for listening to this need. I am proud to be working in Vermont and part of a changing system of care for the individuals, families, and networks. And I truly believe Vermont is a leader in progressive and compassionate care. And the work in the community will continue to evolve. And I appreciate that. And I value the peer perspectives and the collaboration with the peers. The need for these individuals that I just described to you, again, it's, it's different. They can't be met in the community for all the reasons that you've heard about today. And I don't want them to be left behind in our system of care. So thank you for your time committee and thanks commissioner for asking me to, to speak. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Richards. Dr. Richard. I'm going to go gonna back to screen share, screen share um, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to deputy commissioner morning Fox, I'm just trying to keep things moving. Um, uh, just to do a very high level walkthrough of some of the preliminary design um, so that committee members can get a sense of uh, the residents that we're talking about. So I will Share my screen again. Can folks see that? Yes. Okay. Excellent. And Fox or Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox, um, I will advance the slides um, as you direct. <laughs> no worries. Sounds good. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, for the record, uh, Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Mental Health. Um, so what you see in front of you is uh, actually the uh, an artist rendition uh, rendering of uh, the the front entryway of the uh, new recovery residence. Uh, this is based off of the architectural work and design team um, that we had, and we really want to kind of present uh, it's it's a residence and people who would be uh, coming to live there or coming to visit there. That is the the entrance to it. Uh, not through a back door, not through uh, some other uh, type of entrance, but you know through a front front porch, a, a Vermont covered front porch. Um, and so all the parking and such like that. We'll, uh, Commission can go to the next next screen. Um, is is behind the building uh, again, trying to uh, create the sense of a a residence. And so you see at the very bottom there where it says drop off. That's the area that we were just looking at. As uh, the front of the building, uh, the uh, area in the back, uh, there is a, uh, a gymnasium that uh, remains from 
the current site uh, where Woodside is the, and the Woodside building will be demolished and the new building footprint is uh, what would be uh, built. Uh, the outside yard has walking paths, uh, um, places to gather, uh, different, different things. So we have the capacity to have meals outside, have groups outside, or just have the, 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 the need or the, the request for space uh, and things of that sort. Uh, and so you have all of that. And then the staff parking, things of that sort would be uh, around back uh, as well as their, their entrances. And we can go to the next one. So what you see here is uh, one angle of uh, one of the multi-purpose rooms. Uh, there are a couple of rooms in, that were designed in, the, in this residence that uh, resemble kind of large gathering spaces that can be used kind of as a living room model or just uh, places to gather, places to uh, have community meetings, uh, uh, or you know, if there's no uh, actual programming going on in that in that space, it's just a lounge space, whether it be for uh, television or other things, um, or just to have some space. But as you'll see, it has you know a, a wall of windows, and you'll see throughout some of these images uh, the the extensive use of lots of windows to bring in as much natural light and the outdoor into the indoors. Uh, there's a lot of research that's been coming out in recent years of the impact of having natural light in environments. Uh, as you can imagine, the current MTCR in its two FEMA trailers does not really have uh, tremendous uh, light being brought in. And that really has an, an impact on people's natural circadian rhythms and being able to have good sleep and impacts on depression, anxiety, et cetera. Let me go to the next next slide. Uh, and so this is also that, that same room actually, uh, and, it, and it goes out uh, the other side. Um, there's a circular window there that actually uh, the nurse's station is on the other side. So uh, folks can be in there and there's still a line of sight uh, so that uh, people uh, can, can look for a nurse if they need something or nursing can look in, uh, things of that sort. And the doorway actually exits out into the dining area. You can go to the next slide. Um, and this is one of the other uh, living room spaces uh, in, in the residence. This is actually probably one of the first rooms that folks might, might encounter when they come into the building. It's after you come into the entryway, it's on your right. Uh, again, uh, trying to create living room style, comfortable furnishings, comfortable uh, color tones, things of that sort. Um, but also, you know, for any of the, the committee members who have had a chance to visit uh, Middlesex, you're looking at these rooms, the, this room or the last room, take up the entire space of what we have currently um, at, at the, in the trailers. And so really trying to uh, increase that space and bring in as much of the outdoors into the indoors. Okay, we'll go to the next. This is the dining and kitchen area. Uh, there's seating for 16 in the, in the dining area, but there's also separate spaces over by the, the counter in the kitchen. Uh, this is a kitchen that's fully accessible for the residents uh, to cook on their own, to have groups, skill building exercises, things of that sort. It also has a commercial kitchen that's in the back uh, where we will have staff that will prepare all the meals. Uh, except for maybe those times where uh, the residents have decided that they're going to prepare their, their own meals or something of that sort, or we may even have uh, joint uh, cooking exercises and, and such like that around holidays or special occasions, things of that sort. Uh, the door on your right that you see at the end of the, of the dining area actually leads into a, uh, a greenhouse space. Uh, that's, a, again, to, to I know for myself, having my hands in the soil is, is a very grounding experience. Uh, and there's actually a lot of research that supports that. And so bringing in a greenhouse uh, type place for residents to uh, work on their own gardening. And then that access is out into the yard where there's raised beds and other things of that sort so that the residents can raise their own flowers, vegetables, et cetera, for cooking and, and for, for the residents. Okay, we can go to the next one. Uh, and this is just a, a picture outside of one of the rooms. This is in uh, one of the main hallways. Uh, but throughout the, the residence, there will be these little kind of uh, areas of uh, seat cushions and such like that, so that there's places where people can have seat seating and just kind of get away or just take a time out. Uh, 
and uh, and such. And so it's not just that if you need a timeout, you know, or a space to get away, that it's really relegated to your room. There are other places throughout the the residence that uh, folks can can go, or even gather to have a small conversation, either to meet with uh, uh, you know a peer counselor or social worker, or just you know to you know a couple of residents on their own. Okay. And this is uh, the rendering of uh, one of the one of the bedrooms. Each bedroom has their own uh, bathroom, private bath, uh, and uh, uh, you have you know desk and seating, bed, and then uh, kind of the the window bench seating as well and storage areas. There's a large uh, kind of armoire uh, place, and and it's done with the thoughts of again trying to bring in the natural lights and, and, and things of that sort, but also keeping an eye to uh, ligature points and things of that sort as well in trying to develop and make sure that we have as safe an environment as possible uh, for folks, so. And then finally, just that, you know, it's a, we can't stress enough that the, the work here, we're really looking at uh, trying to bring in as much trauma-informed uh, kind of thinking and, and work uh, throughout this. And one of the, the big parts of this is peer support. Um, and so we're looking at having uh, as part of the treatment team, peer counselors uh, that are actually uh, employed and working at the residence, uh, as well as uh, significant uh, collaboration with other peer organizations like Vermont Psychiatric Survivors. And not only having uh, folks that may come in as uh, peer representatives uh, to advocate and support residents, but also to help collaborate with, with us in programming, uh, come in to do programming, uh, things of that sort. So uh, it's a, uh, uh, a really important piece and we just didn't want to lose sight of that and wanted to just bring that to the forefront here. Great, thank you, Fox. Yep. Can folks hear me or am I muted? Oh, you're good. Excellent. Um, so I'm going to stop screen sharing for a moment, and I'm, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Kevin Huckshorn and Dr. Janice LaBelle um, to share a little bit from their perspective. Um, as I mentioned, they're really um, excellent national content experts, um, have been consulting with the department for years in terms of our overall implementation as a state of six core strategies. Um, and we've also brought them in to help support us around um, the design of this programming and this project overall. So I will pause and uh, I think I will turn it over to Dr. Huckshorn to start. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor to be invited to participate uh, in this very important um, committee meeting. Um, my name is Kevin Huckshorn. I'm a psychiatric nurse by training. I've been in the field for about 41 years. Um, as Commissioner Squirrel says, I've been lucky enough to be working with the Vermont system of care since about 2005, uh, when I was um, the director of the National Technical Assistance Center for State Mental Health Programming in Washington, DC. And I did that for about 10 years, um, went on to become the commissioner of mental health and substance abuse in Delaware for six years, where I um, was challenged uh, to implement a US DOJ settlement agreement based on Olmstead and the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, US DOJ had found that Delaware was um, too invested in inpatient services and had too many beds and not enough community services. So I wanna start out by saying that I'm a real proponent of the American with Disabilities Act and the right for people to live in the community um, with disabilities and with supports that surround them and was lucky enough to uh, be able to implement that system of care in Delaware and reduce a number of our inpatient state hospital by about 100 beds, as well as bring up to scale a number of community programs. That said, in my experience working in most all of the states in the country, um, there is always a set or and usually a small group of people with these complex disorders that really need these kinds of services that are being discussed today in terms of a step down um, secure residential system. Because without that, they end up staying in a more restrictive 
more unnatural system, which is usually our inpatient level one beds as you term them in Vermont. Um, it is, I, I have to give you kudos for looking at both the needs of this group of people that are currently sitting in your level one beds um, and, and really trying to expand the options for these folks so they can get out of those beds, open up your, those, those beds for other people that need them who are often sitting in emergency rooms or just not getting the level of services they need um, while being able to provide an opportunity for these, this group of, of uh, young people in many cases or, or middle-aged people with disabilities to get the kind of rehabilitation services based on evidence-based practices that we know now work um, and to move them back out into the community. And I think, you know, having sat in a number of meetings on this issue and really hearing the, the very valid concerns of the advocacy, the, the Vermont advocacy folks, you know, I have to just say that it's not either or. Um, uh, a state has the responsibility, as you all know, to, tr to, pry to try and provide for the most vulnerable people. And these are some of your most vulnerable people and they deserve to, to be served in a, in a best practice type of system that's recovery oriented, trauma informed and helps them learn to manage the challenges that are keeping them from being successful as adults in their community. Um, that said, just Vermont is very similar to most other states um, in terms of the need to continue to grow and support our community service systems with diversion programs and ACT teams and peer support inpatient and outpatient uh, services that include um, bridge, bridging services from higher levels to lower levels of care, independent living, single site housing and vocational services. And I think Vermont's well on its way um, you guys really, I mean, I remember back in 1998, we were looking at improving systems of care in Florida and I was sent to Vermont and to Oregon back in 1998 as models of best practices. So um, I think, you know, we all find ourselves struggling with um, our individual state needs. And again, I just have to say that um, I think the planning that's gone into this program has been robust and thorough. I think that the discussion about the need to use EIPs has been robust and thorough, and I give kudos to the department to um, agreeing to negotiate the need for those. Um, and, and I uh, can only say that my colleague, Jan, Dr. Robel, and I um, are uh, in support of this process, how it's been going so far. Um, I think, I'm not sure if my colleague is still um, on the phone. We are also working with another program in Vermont. And so we're kind of taking turns um, doing that work today. And she may have dropped off to, to help out on that other project. If not, Janice, um, please speak up. And otherwise I'll turn it back over to the commissioner. So there she is. Thank you, Dr. Hawkshorn, and um, thank you, Chairman Lippert and Commissioner Squirrel, and thank you to the House Healthcare Committee. It's, it's a pleasure, it's an honor to share my perspective, and I will say quite succinctly what Dr. Hawkshorn said, I absolutely echo. My perspective is slightly different in that I've been working in public mental health in a neighboring state for the last 36 years and I oversee facility-based care and working on transformation within our state system. I can just um, absolutely affirm what Dr. Hopshorn has said that the elements that are in this proposal are absolutely consistent with state-of-the-art evidence-based practice and what every state system should have in place to be able to address some of the critical challenges that every state, and it's happening in my own state right next door, we have a serious problem with emergency department boarding, which is creating a clog in the system and backlog throughout hospital-based care and the flow through the system creates its own problems when it's impeded because we don't have an adequate continuum of care. So what I think is being proposed here is absolutely consistent with state-of-the-art 
uh, practice and what's essential to be able to get the system and keep it functioning well. I would, however, say that um, Commissioner Squirrel and her team have gone further than what they've recommended because it's not just a really solid evidence-based trauma-informed approach. This model is trauma responsive. It's one thing to be trauma informed, that's taking the information, but there's a responsibility owed to the information and that's what's present in this model and not just in its design, but how the design has been formed by the consumers, by the person served, by the advocates and respected. And that's what I see in this is that the model the process all connotes tremendous respect and value for the service, the service users, and the advocacy community itself. So I think what you've got before you is a very solid proposal that is trauma responsive, state of the art, and associated with strong, positive, sustained outcomes. So what you will find is that people will be able to read the, receive the service and not come back into higher level of care. So I thank you for this opportunity to be able to share this perspective. I apologize for having to drop off quickly to attend to another meeting, but I thank you again. I was muted. Um, thank you, Dr. LaBelle. Thank you, Dr. Huckshorn. Um, really appreciate um, your thinking and sharing your perspectives and also the great perspectives that you've afforded to the department as we continue to evolve and improve our proposal. Um, as I said, I feel a deep sense of responsibility to provide care for these individuals and to also be responsive um, to the feedback that we've received from the community. Um, so I'll just wanted to share a little bit in terms of next steps, and then we can open it up for questions um, if it serves the chair. Uh, I do have a slide related to the timeline. Um, I won't put it back up, but you can view that on your own. Um, well, maybe I will share it just briefly, just so folks can see. Let's see here. Okay, do folks see the full screen? We do. Excellent. Um, so this is the current um, project schedule and timeline, and just a little bit related to the, the capital bill and that process in and of itself, um, just for the committee to be aware, the Department of Mental Health, or I should say BGS, Building Grounds and Services, already received an initial tranche of funds of $4.5 million to start the process um, to um, replace the current recovery residents. Um, those funds have been utilized for the design development that we've talked about, some of the select site selection pieces, et cetera. Um, and then our current capital bill request is for the balance of that, which I think is just over um, $11 million. So I just wanted to share that just as a point of reference. Um, and this is the current construction timeline. You can see where we have come in terms of some of the uh, design work that we have done. And then when you look out ahead, you know, given the sense of urgency and replacing the existing facility, you know, if we are able to advance this and move it forward, then we would be ready for occupancy um, at the end of December 2022. Uh, so I just wanted to note that. Um, also wanting to note that the department um, is greatly looking forward to continuing to work with our advocacy partners, DRVT, NAMI, Legal Aid, Vermont Psychiatric Survivors, um, um, and others. Um, and certainly I think we are poised to significantly advance our mental health system of care in the right direction and to provide equitable access of care to those who need it um, and really require the step down capacity. And so with that, um, I think we will pause and uh, we will open it up for questions. Great. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner and others. Uh, we. We're going to take some questions right now in, res in order to be respectful for other witnesses. We're going to have to come back to further questions at another time, I'm afraid, uh, because I think there are a lot of questions. I certainly have some and others do, I know. Uh, but let's start by, I think Representative Peterson uh, had uh, a question and then I think I think Representative Burroughs and then Representative Black. Yes. Let's try to be focused in our questions if we can. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Uh... Representative Lippert. Uh, 
Commissioner Squirrel, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. The only thing I was wondering about, and one of the slides you showed the new facility and the existing facility. New facility uh, annual operating cost was 9.1 million. The existing was 3.1 million. There, you also mentioned 2.9 million operating costs, staff of 28. So it's around 3 million to operate. You're going from seven beds to 16. I'm wondering why the operating cost is so much more. Why Why was it? Is, are you adding other things and, and does that make it more? I'm just curious. Yeah, no, it's a, it, it's a it's great- a, It's a question I think a number of us have. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question, thank you. And as I noted, um, those initial operating estimates uh, were based on our previous proposal. Um, essentially, we'd be looking at going from, I think it's 28 staff to possibly 70 staff. So a significant increase in staffing. I think it, we had currently proposed at about 41 new staff. Um, so that is the primary growth, I think, in the operating costs. Um, given the shift that we have made in terms of um, not um, contemplating the use of seclusion and restraint at this program, um, that does decrease our needs for um, on-call doctors, other staffing needs, which will decrease the staffing grids. Um, so we do anticipate um, that the overall operating costs uh, will be reduced. Um, I just don't have those numbers for you today. I need to go back with my team. We need to, um, you know, work with our partners to kind of uh, recalibrate um, what those staffing needs will be, and then to come back to you with a revised number, which I anticipate will be lower. And then again, um, that the general fund portion of that is less than the overall operating cost because we can utilize Medicaid. So just wanted to note that as well. Okay, and the cost of the project was eleven million. Is that what I heard? The total construction cost is actually sixteen million, but we have already received four point five million dollars in a previous capital bill allocation. The operating costs would be a part of our FY twenty three budget ask. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I'll just note for a further point, a point in time, we will be very interested to know where that additional operating cost funding will come from since there's nothing in the budget currently and it must come from somewhere. So you can answer that at a different time. Uh, Representative Burroughs. Thank you very much. Uh, one, one short question, which is uh, what are the stars, what do the stars represent on your timeline? Oh. Am I still sharing my screen? No. Uh -huh. Um, okay, the stars on the timeline, I believe, indicate things that have been completed. Um, so the design development estimate, the construction document, demo site mobilization. Uh, so I think I might have to follow up with BGS to get clarity on that, because now that I look at that, I'm not sure. So I apologize. I don't know, uh, Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox, do you have more insight into the stars? Unfortunately, I don't. Okay, but um, my other question is, uh, what alternatives did you explore before moving ahead with this plan? Alternatives to serve this population? Yep. Thank you. Yeah, of course. So I think that what we have seen and what we have experienced, and again, I think this was a decision that was made um, back when post-Hurricane Irene, um, when Act 79 was put into place, there was a significant investment um, in the community at that time. I think that's where we established a lot of our network of intensive recovery residences, also identified that there was still a continued need um, for this subacute population who required a secure setting. So I think, um, the need for this setting was established at that time. And what we have continued to see is increasing demand and acuity. We continue to see this cohort of individuals um, who is occupying longer lengths of stay in our inpatient beds. Um, we continue to see an experience that based on, I think, some of the vignettes that Dr. Richards um, shared, 
that these individuals do present um, with complex safety needs in the community as well. Um, and so we, we really do want to make sure that we can continue to serve them. And I think that the current use of the seven, seven bed facility um, has been a real example of that success, um, that we have had that capacity to step down individuals to, and they have then been able to transition um, to the community. Um, and so continuing to expand that and build on that success uh, feels very critical in addition um, to recognizing and experiencing some of the limitations of those community supports um, pending these individuals' needs. So I, I guess what I'm asking is, did you look at uh, what you could do by scrapping the whole thing and starting over with a, a different kind of program? Or did you just decide to move forward with, um, with filling the need that you knew was already there and, and go, going with what you know? Yeah, I think we certainly evaluated, you know, was this program actually meeting the needs of the individuals that it was designed to serve? Um, and I think our assessment from that was yes. If the current Middlesex program was not meeting those needs, then I think we absolutely um, would have pivoted um, to something else or thought about a different kind of program. Um, and certainly have evaluated that having this critical capacity in a secure setting for individuals with these high acuity needs um, continues to be an essential component of our system of care. So I would, a 65% success rate is, is, uh, is I, I don't know, is that an, a, a very good outcome or is it, is it ideal or I, I, I really, I don't know. So I'm just asking you. It's a good question. And I think given the acuity of the individuals that we're talking about, I think some of the, the vignettes that Dr. Richard Sears shared hopefully gave you a sense of some of the needs of these individuals that a 65% um, step down right to the community um, certainly feels like a success to me. Um, and Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox, I know that you were trying to say something as well. I, I would I would just add that uh, you know during during the time the past several years uh, while we've had the Middlesex uh, residents uh, in trying to uh, support some of the individuals as Dr. Richards kind of described. Uh, in getting out of the hospital um, and you know not having beds necessarily available uh, at Middlesex to transition to, uh, so as to not have people left in 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 hospitals, uh, you know, because that's one thing we we all agree on that uh, from a state we've been a leader in uh, trying to deinstitutionalize and and not warehouse individuals in in hospitals who do not need to be there. And so some of the work that we've done uh, is to try to create some individualized plans uh, for folks. Part of that is what, what has created some of the MyPads uh, as, as discussed. Uh, the, the part of the issue with the MyPads is that it takes anywhere from eight to 18 months to get that set up in that the designated agency has to find the actual residents and get it prepared find the staffing, get them prepared, and then eventually transition those, those folks from hospital to uh, a MAGPAD -like, like place. And so, you know, we, we've looked at other, other models like that. Uh, and, you know, a MAGPAD does work for, for many individuals, but again, every time we're trying to set that up for each individual, it could take up to a year, year and a half to actually get that set up. Uh, and you know when we set up individual plans, uh, you know for just a, a single individual, we're looking at uh, again similar startup timeframes to finding the place and the staffing, but also when you're talking about an economy of scale of one, uh, it becomes a pretty cost prohibitive um, in, in that sense as well. So we have looked at some other models and have done some of those other things in order to get people out of the hospital. Um, I think that's partly why we landed kind of in this direction as well. Thank you, uh, Representative. We're gonna take a few more questions and then we're gonna take a break. 
and then we're going to uh, hear from our other witnesses. I'm going to also just note that I think uh, there, there are going to be many questions that don't get a chance to be asked today. And so we're going to need to find a time for the commissioner and deputy commissioner to return, perhaps with others, but to really, there needs to be a time when we can ask all the questions we have in order to not feel like we're not getting uh, that, that opportunity. But it's a balance, trying to find a respect for other witnesses to be heard as well. So we're gonna take uh, Representative Black, Representative Donahue, Representative Page, and I will go to hold on my questions uh, reluctantly. Thank you, Chairman Lippert. Um, you, you may have answered a little bit of this in your, in your last answer. I'm really wondering um, what percentage of um, residents in Middlesex currently end up going back to a level one bed? And if there's kind of a revolving door between the level one beds and a step down facility. And if you think that this new facility addresses some of that, um, I don't know if that's a problem. I'm asking if it is a problem. Yeah, it's a great question. And I would just add that, you know, creating this step down capacity, improving the environment of care will all will have great benefits for the current residents um, and for new residents, um, uh, particularly, you know, given the acuity um, that we are providing that step down care for. I would also say that it's really important um, and that we acknowledge and have good systems in place to identify when someone might require ho hospital level of care um, as part of their treatment and recovery. Um, certainly what we're proposing to do is create an environment of care that mediates against that to the best of our ability because we've created a trauma-informed setting. We've got the right staffing, you know, the right programmatic components, the right trauma response, um, trauma-informed response. Um, but someone may require um, you know, rehospitalization to stabilize and assess. So um, certainly when we talk about the individuals that we have successfully transitioned to the community, um, there are also individuals that have had to be rehospitalized, just as there are, you know, across all of our intensive recovery residences, group homes. Um, certainly, you know, that is something, you know, that that is does happen um, for individuals. So I do think our proposal uh, will hopefully mediate against that. That's part of the intention. Um, and that by having this step down level of care that's appropriate for them, we mediate against as well to Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox's point, you know, we're con our care management team works 24 seven to try to move individuals to the community. And when we don't have capacity in the middle sex, for example, and then we're trying to fit capacity in the community. Um, and sometimes we worry that maybe it, it's not the right fit. You know, are we asking the community provider to do too much? Um, are we really able to keep individuals safe? And then we have those failed community placements um, that are really um, not in the interest of the individual's recovery. We don't want anyone to be put at a public safety risk. Um, so those are other factors that we take into consideration as well, you know, when we think about this. And okay, thank Fox, you. I, oh, of course. Oh, no, go ahead. I was just, uh, I was just gonna add that um, there have been a, uh, a handful of folks, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, that have been rehospitalized and then readmitted uh, to, mm -hmm. to Middlesex. Uh, that does happen. Um, by and far, uh, that's, that's not the, the norm, you know, but I would, you know, I think, I think we've served 53 individuals, but have had maybe 60, over 60 admissions, um, you know, to, to the facility. So, so there are some folks who have been, uh, have been rehospitalized after a period of stability, and then have have returned. Um, and there's some variations to to kind of that that um, that that kind of occurrence. Um, but uh, um, so it does happen. I I do want to be clear that 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 does happen um, and such. Um, and you know I, I think as the commissioner said, our goal here is to try to help uh, through the. The environment of care and the staffing and uh, the treatment modalities that we can actually uh, put into place in this new residence that really aren't able to be done functionally well in two trailers um, will will have an impact on that. Um, 
I think our outcomes will, and kind of devil's in the details, the outcomes will tell us how, how much of an impact. Um, I think the research kind of supports that it will have a significant impact, but I think we'll have to see how that, how that plays out yet. Representative Donahue and then Representative Page, and then we're going to take a break. Yeah, I'm just going to put about three questions out there that we can come back to, but um, you probably don't know them offhand anyway. So first of all, I didn't see on the timeline where the um, certificate of need process with the Green Mountain Care Board fit in and how that affects the planned timeline. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, the um, uh, it would be good to follow up more on that discharge data, what happens to the 30% who... Um, what, what happens with them, but also the long-term um, tracking of uh, people who leave the hospital, as you said, six months or a year may be back. How, how does that compare in terms of long-term uh, trajectory? But the third one is, I think two weeks ago when you were here, I had asked for data on the forensic breakdown. So I would really appreciate getting that. I think that's really actually critically important because of other moving pieces and the Senate and so forth that could change uh, lengths of stay and so forth. Understanding what for involuntary patients and level one and the current secure residents, what the percentage um, of the uh, care time, the bed days are uh, forensic status patients. Yes, so, um, thank I you can. For that. Yeah, thank you, Representative Donahue. All great questions. Uh, the COM process we have put in our application or notification of intent to apply. Um, and certainly there's an opportunity for other stakeholders and partners to weigh in on that process. Uh, we can follow up. We did start to look at the discharge data or looking at you know the other um, uh, 30 plus percent, if you will, so we can follow up on that and then see what longitudinal data we have in terms of um, beyond that. And I thought we had pulled some of the forensic data. I'm just looking at my notes here, um, but we may have to follow up with you on that. Yeah, I have some data here related to forensic emissions in FY20 to FY21, but these numbers look low to me. So I, I just wanna confirm um, before I state that so I can follow. Right, because it's actually not the number of individuals as much as you know how much of the bed use and yeah. the secure residential, uh, how many of those folks are the, the cohort as you call them that uh, go to secure residential. Thank you. Of course, thank you. Let's come back to some of those questions. Uh, Representative Page. Yes, and you can answer these questions later on. Um, but you made a pledge that uh, Chair Lippert um, emphasized. Will you be putting that in writing uh, so that we can perhaps see it in the future? And also, will this, as mental health needs grow in our communities, is this going to be large enough in this facility? Thank you. It's a great question, Representative Page. And can I just clarify in terms of what you're requesting in terms of the, the pledge? Well, it's, it, it's based upon what Representative Lippert um, called out earlier, Alvin. Oh. I was just noting what, I was just repeating what was being said and I didn't want yes. to get lost. Yes, uh, Representative Page, um, we will ensure that um, I guess maybe the easiest way to do that would be through the document that we shared with you that gives an overview of the program and we can state that explicitly. And in terms of your good question about capacity um, and data, so we did look at, you know, kind of current capacity operating at somewhat full capacity on a regular basis, looking at the, you know, bed days that these individuals occupy in terms of level one looking at the demand that we're currently seeing for these beds, which is where we arrived at this number. Also um, wanting to be thoughtful and careful about staying under the threshold of what would be considered an IMD. Um, so that you know, is something that um, we're also thoughtful about as well. I think the department um, is confident that um, the current capacity that we have proposed um, will address current need and future need as well. And could you expand at a future basis if needed? I would have to, I mean, the, the site footprint, I think 
may limit future expansion, but that is certainly something we could look at. And we're always being thoughtful about um, the space itself being able to be reconverted for other purposes. You know, for example, when we've talked about the 12 new level one beds at the retreat as needs, capacity shifts in the system of care, could those beds become, you know, some kind of intensive crisis bed? So those are things that we're also thinking about. But I think I'd have to consult with BGS in terms of the footprint and whether or not um, it could afford expansion. And one other piece, just to speak on the expansion, uh, we also would have to really take a close look at that uh, as well, because when, if we expand beyond 16 beds, um, the federal government would potentially look at that as an institute of mental disease or an IMD, uh, which could mean a loss of the federal funding uh, for the for the for the residents. So, okay. I uh, so thank you. I'm I am going to indulge myself at least with one question that just jumps off the page, and I just don't want it to be confused. Uh, in terms of the photos that uh, represent or that uh, Deputy Commissioner Fox was showing us, uh, this is indeed continuing to be a secure residential facility, is it not? That's and correct. So, so will there be a secure fence around the entire facility? Yes, it will be similar. Well, the fence will not be similar, but the current secure recovery residence um, is surrounded by a fence as yeah, well. I think, I think we just need to not be, not, not to be uh, unaware that hearing, seeing pictures of the facility itself does not suggest, or leaves one wondering, but it's, but in fact, a secure facility that will be surrounded by a uh, fence. It, and it just, has it. And just yeah, to be it has clear, a, just it to has clear. one in the picture. It's just hard to see. Yeah, it's hard and to it tell. basically just follows the outline of the buildings. The yards are very small, so it's just contained there on, on the picture. It's, oh, but, but I just it's hard to see. I, I'm yeah. not. I don't want to just focus on that, but I think it would be a mistake for people to be to be misled or misunderstand that that is a change in the design. So. Uh, no, that the, and just to be clear, it's the the residence itself is not surrounded by a fence. The the side and rear yards have fencing. There's no fence in the front of the building uh, and such like that. So when you approach the building, you don't have to go through a fence to get okay. into it. It's not clear from yeah. from the presentation. Yeah. Okay. So um, and I, I have I have other questions as as do others, but this has been very helpful. I think. Um, it's clear as, as well that there's been some responsiveness on the part of the department to some of the questions and concerns that have been raised by advocates, advocates and frankly, legislators as well. Um, but I think right now uh, I'm gonna suggest, so I'm gonna just, hey, I gotta take charge of this and make try to have the time work. So uh, Devin Green, you are listed as our last witness today, and because you have more flexibility many times than others, I'm going to ask if we're not able to get to you today that we reschedule you from the hospital association. It has no impact, is no reflection on your testimony, but I wanna make sure that uh, our, we scheduled someone from uh, Vermont Care Partners because they we moved them up on the list only because they had a time constraint, and I, we'll hear from them and then Warden is it Neil, Nile, Nile, I think. Uh, we'll hear from Ward uh, Malika and I'm Kareem. Uh, let's come back, Let, let's take a, uh, let's be realistic and come back at 25 after. Let's take a stretch, let's go off, let's go off video. We all need a break from Zoom. Uh, let's rest our eyes and hopefully get up and stretch. And we'll, we'll start promptly at 25 after with uh, hearing from, and I'm my Kathleen, and I'm sorry, the printing on my machine doesn't show your last name properly, but we'll, we'll come back.